If you look around you, who are the people in your life? Where do you live? What do you drive? Where do you work? How do you feel? Like the world is your mirror. The, there's, a, there's a concept that we work with that your outer reality is a reflection of your inner experience. So if I really kind of, you know, like I, I dumb it down for myself and, and, I, and I track patterns. If I have three or four people talking shit to me in my life, I probably have somebody talking shit to me in my mind. It's that simple. If it's being reflected out to me, you know, re reflected back to me from my outer reality, it's going on inside. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Chris King, who shares how to unlock our limits to live fully out. <laughs> Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life? To wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward. How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and bring balance to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote comes from Nietzsche. You have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, and the only way, it does not exist. You know, I struggled with this my whole life. I thought I had the correct way, the only way, and the right way. Boy, was I wrong also put limits on myself. Let me ask you a question. What do you think is impossible for you that if made possible would allow you to live the ultimate life? So here's my question. Why is it impossible and what's holding you back besides the reflection in the mirror? We're going to chat about that today and even share a way to break out and find your way forward. Let's make the impossible possible. Chris King says, does it often appear to others that you are crushing life, but in reality, you feel like life is crushing you? He is the living embodiment of triumph against all odds. From a childhood full of adversity, he rewrote his script of his own life. He went from an academic journey to being an NCAA hockey player within a year of putting on skates. And that was just the beginning. He gave up a six-figure career and embraced destitution in pursuit of something greater. That transformation. He's going to share his insights so that you can unleash your potential to achieve the unfathomable. Let's meet Chris and see how. Welcome to Richer Soul, Chris King. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks so much. Great to be here. And I'm excited to learn from you today. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? <laughs> well, let's see. I grew up in a very privileged neighborhood in a very scary house. Um, so dad was, uh, was a bit of a tyrant. We, um, my, my eldest sister died when she was 11 years old. And so that, that created a lot of, you know, grief and rage and abuse and addiction. And it was, it was a tough growing up, uh, in, in that framework. But, um, I didn't of course know that at the time because I didn't have a reference point other than that. Right. So for me, it wasn't like, it, it didn't seem traumatic. It just, it was just life. Right. So, um, 
So when, it, you know, when I say, you know, what was it like growing up? I, I don't know how to articulate this in any other way, just other than, you know, I kind of lived in threat response and it was, uh, you know, dad and mom did the best they could. Um, but yeah, it, they, they provided very well in terms of, you know, food and clothing, but there were, there were some other things that were probably, probably a different or missing, I guess. And, and that would make sense. You know, it's funny though, when we don't have a frame of reference, everything seems normal. Yeah. Yeah. Like when, when you think about the trauma of your life, whatever that is, right. Especially early on, like you don't even know it's trauma until later. Like you sort of learn that. <laughs> <laughs> Was there like an aha point or at some point that you realized that things weren't normal growing up? Well, I mean, I sort of joke now, you know, I'd say I had a dysfunctional childhood, but that implies there's another kind, right? You know, I mean, I think that childhood is inherently dysfunctional for, I think, all of us, um, or at least most of us. So I, I think it wasn't until I was in my early 40s when a, a friend of mine was, I was relating my, my childhood and how, you know, here in Los Angeles, I might, you know, eight years old, I might be seven or eight miles away from the house on my bicycle. and. And she said to me, like listening to this, she's like, Chris, that's not normal. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we were very feral children, you know. Gen X, we're 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 the only generation that was 30 years old by the time we're 12, and now we're in our 50s and we're still 30. So that's you know <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Cause yeah, Gen X is it seems like lately I'm noticing nobody talks about Gen X. They're kind of like this forgotten generation. It's, you know, the boomers still kind of rule, even though they're, you know, pretty much starting to really age out of the workforce. And then everyone's focused on the young. That Gen X gen seems to just have uh, been ignored. <laughs> Well, we're also not ones to to beat our chests, you know. Gen X, it's like we again, it doesn't really occur to us to be prideful or whatever, you know. If we can get out of enough self loathing or something, and just you know, we just stack up and and do what we need to do and and make our way in the world, you know. We didn't have social media, we weren't like posting selfies or any of this, so it's not, you know, we're we weren't the hey look at me generation, and um, and so yeah, we just sort of kind of mind our business and do our thing and get stuff done. Pretty much, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, why might we might be a little self absorbed? It wasn't like you know my grandfather's generation, the greatest generation. They had a they had a world war to fight, you know. But um, but yeah, so we might be a little self absorbed, but you know, we're just making our way in the world and generally want to be left alone most of the time. Did any of those things kind of hold you back as an adult, or not really? I don't think so. I mean the um. I, if anything, it might have helped, you know, because I wasn't, I don't think I was busy trying to make something look like something. You know, I think most of us in Gen X were just doing things, right? So we weren't trying to make it look like we were living a certain way. You know, I think if, if we look at a lot of social media, it's very oriented around making things look a certain way. And that's not something that's particularly of interest, you know? I mean, I think like, look at, uh, you know, and 1981 MTV launched and that changed the world of music because previously music was about the human condition or politics, social issues, whatever. And, you know, shortly after MTV launched, music became about image. And so it was like, how do we make it look versus what are we doing? And that's true. You know, it's funny when I go back and I look at some of the groups from the, the late 60s, probably into the early 70s, and you watch them on YouTube, you're like, they'd never make it today because <laughs> right. they don't have the image, right? They don't right. look like, you know, they're just average people kind of singing a song. Well, and I think how that relates for my organization today is, you know, I don't really care what something looks like. You know, I'm going to look through a very binary lens, effective or ineffective, right? Working or not working. And so I, you know, it, it doesn't have to look a certain way. It needs to work. And that makes a lot of sense. That's the way I look at things too. I don't fuss over the the imagery, and and I know a lot of people do, but that's fine. So you had an interesting early adulthood, though. 
I mean, you played hockey, you did some other wild stuff. <laughs> Can you share a little bit about that? Well, yeah. It, and, you know, it really was kind of great training ground. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very much uh, not the norm in, in anywhere I go in that, you know, like you mentioned the hockey thing. I was born and raised in Southern California, not exactly a hockey hotbed, right? And, and I was 21 years old when I decided I wanted to be an NCAA ice hockey player. And there were only two things in my way at that time. Uh, the first thing was that I was failing out of my junior college. And the second thing was that I had never skated before a day in my life. <laughs> and so, but fast forward 18 months and I was leading that team into the state championships, fourth in goals and first in assists. And so it really was this great training ground for how do I make the seemingly impossible happen really quickly? And this is exactly what we do for our clients now. I mean, as it turns out, there is a science through the lenses of, uh, through the lenses of psychology, through the lenses of neurobiology, through energy fields, there is a science to making impossible things happen. And once you understand that science, you can apply that anywhere. And I have found that, that certain universal principles, when they are applied, apply throughout every area of life. And those are the ones you need to follow. Because those are truly the ones that that it help you achieve the success that uh, that you want. So let's chat a little bit about your book. What inspired you to write the book, Renegotiate Your Existence, Unlock Your Impossible Life? It started as a very uninspirational story, right? It started as a marketing piece. Like I, I need to write a book, you know, to kind of put some some content out there and, and really get this company moving. But somewhere in the middle of writing it, I actually started to care about it. And I was like, you know, I, I do not want to put some marketing piece out there. If I was going to do that, I just would have paid some agency to write it for me and been done with it, right? So um, so I sat down with my co-author, Michael Ashley, who's fantastic. And had it not been for him to extract everything from my head to, to organize it so I could actually write this thing, it wouldn't happen. Um, but I decided I wanted to put something of value out there. So, so the book is essentially a toolbox. You know, I have, you know, I mentioned I have a history of making seemingly impossible things happen. And I have, I have completely uh, re reimagined and reinvented myself several times throughout the course of my life. And so you, you know, and, and, your listener understands this. You, you can renegotiate a job. You can renegotiate a salary. You can renegotiate pretty much anything. And I will tell you, you can renegotiate your entire existence. And that's where the title came from. Um, and you can make the seemingly impossible a reality. And the book is essentially a toolbox. Here's a bunch of stuff to get you started. I think the first problem, and you kind of mentioned this in the book, is that most people are trapped and they don't even know it. Correct. If I just run this through the lens of neuroscience, right, we're essentially human beings that are going out in the world and unconsciously seeking to validate the reality of our understanding. So there, there's an operating system in your head, just like a phone or a computer has one, so does every human. And that human is the sole architect of that system. And so what we're doing with this, and, and we're completely unconscious of what that system is and how it works. And so we're going out into the world and unconsciously validating that system is correct. And so the opportunity, if you want to bend reality, is to imagine the system you need in order to produce that reality and then see if you can validate that one, which you obviously will be able to do. Like, I'm just a systems hacker. You know, like everything is a system, a business, a, a team, a human being is a system. And any system can be hacked if you understand that system well enough. Reality itself is the end result of a system, and you can hack it. I believe in the same way that, you know, everything is kind of a system. Um, I guess I haven't applied it as much in such a broad way as you have to be able to, to do that. But again, it's just re-engineering your life to figure out what it is that you want and then going after it. Mm -hmm. So let's take a step back, because for most people, I think, let's call it their programming, their beliefs are based on their six-year-old self. Yes, that is correct. So what is the easiest way to start reprogramming our six-year-old self? Because quite frankly, you know, when you're 50 years old, you really don't want to behave like a six-year-old anymore. <laughs> right. 
unconscious six year old driving gr- driving ninety something percent of your reality. Um, there there are many modalities through many different lenses. We can talk hypnotherapy. We can talk about Gestalt therapy. We can talk about you know CBT or DBT. We can talk like all the things. Um, I would say the first step, if I'm looking for a common thread for any modality, no matter what you're going to do, the first step is awareness. And I know that's going to sound like some kind of West Side Woo thing, but the, but the reality is that until there is awareness, there's no choice. You have to become aware of what that system is before you can change it. And most people are unaware. Yeah. It's, and it's shockingly easy to become aware. Because ultimately, all you have to do is look around you. If you look around you, who are the people in your life? Where do you live? What do you drive? Where do you work? How do you feel? Like the world is your mirror. The, there's, a, there's a concept that we work with that your outer reality is a reflection of your inner experience. So if I really kind of, you know, like I, I dumb it down for myself and, and, I, and I track patterns. If I have three or four people talking shit to me in my life, I probably have somebody talking shit to me in my mind. It's that simple. If it's being reflected out to me, you know, re- reflected back to me from my outer reality, it's going on inside. So how do we rapidly, I guess, become aware and challenge some of those beliefs? Well, if you look at your outer reality. Let's take romantic partnership, right? Like Lauren on our team, she does all the relationship coaching and and life transitions and and she's fantastic. And so when somebody says, um, you know, somebody might say to Lauren, like, well, I, I'm in this romantic partnership, but I know I deserve somebody better. You know, my response, Lauren's response would be, no, you don't. You don't know that. Because if you did know that, like you really knew it, it would be reflected back to you in your reality. So if you're in a a romantic partnership that is substandard or not what you want or whatever, and you think you deserve better, you might think that. But there's there's the delta between knowing and not knowing is very small. The delta between knowing and doing is much greater. And the step beyond that is the delta between the doing and the embodying. Now, when you embody that reality that you deserve better, then and only then will it be reflected back to you and you will experience that in your physical world reality. So let's break into that one a little bit deeper. Okay. Right? Somebody says to Lauren, I deserve better. She says, no, you don't, so to speak. What has to happen to go from there to embodying that? you truly deserve somebody better? That's a great question because it's all about tools and practices, right? The same is true for money. Somebody says, I know I deserve more money than this. No, you don't. No, you don't. You think it, but you're not really knowing it and you're not practicing the embodiment of it because once you do that, it will start to come in. So, um, so the first thing is to, is to own, the, own that truth that, you know what, it's not being reflected back to me, so I don't actually know this. What do I need to do to prove this to myself? Now you're mobilized. Now you're in motion. Everything is energy, right? And so when we get energy moving, now things start to happen. So it's all about tools. It's all about challenging what you think and basically proving yourself wrong in terms of um because again, the outer reality is that you deserve X amount of money and that's the money you have. You have to be wrong about that. You know, if you're only making, you know, let's say you're making $150,000 a year and you think you're worth $250,000 a year. It's like, well, you have to be wrong about the 150. I'm just thinking through this. Um, Like in what ways am I proving to myself right now that this is the relationship I deserve, that this is the income I deserve, that this is the whatever I deserve? Now, what do I need to do in theory to prove to myself that I really deserve the 250, that I really deserve the relationship, that I really deserve the thing? Now you're mobilized. Now you have an action plan. How long does it take to bring about this change? I had a client who had a professional service firm. She said, we doubled her revenues, we eliminated her stress, and we saved her marriage. That took us four months. 
That's quick. How do you double your revenue in four months? You got to be willing to be wrong about what you think is possible. Like when I go into a, an organization and they might say something, you know, and I ask them, I said, so, you know, what are we doing here? And they'll say, oh, we want to grow our business, I don't know, 15%, 20%. My first question is, why not 30? Why not 50? Why not 100? Because when people tell me what they want, they generally, they're not telling me what they want. They're telling me what they think is possible. And they always come back with, well, based on market trends and KPIs and sales histories and blah, 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 and all this crap that I do not, I do not let them bring to that first meeting. Do not bring me your KPIs. Do not bring me your market trends or your sales history because it's going to screw up my perception of what's possible. There's something called the Bannister Principle. For you know, your listener probably knows this um, because you have a sophisticated crowd. But the Bannister Principle was the guy that the four minute mile guy, right? So throughout the 1900s, the early to mid 1900s, the world was obsessed with the idea of watching a human being run a mile in under four minutes. And all the scientists and the doctors said, you can't do it. And if you do, it'll kill you. Well, in May of 1954, Roger Bannister broke that sub that ran that sub four minute mile. His record after decades of people trying to do this, his record lasted 46 days. Because collective consciousness of what they believed was possible changed. So people say seeing is believing. That is absolutely backwards. Believing is seeing. Once you change what you believe to be possible, you'll change what actually happens much faster. Did you know he was somewhat of a scientist? He actually figured out how to breathe so he could better use oxygen to hit those levels. Right. Hacking the human system. We have a lot of this today, right? There's, there's a ton of biohackers out there like, oh, do this, do that. They're in all kinds of ways. You know, the human system, right? And I call humans, I sort of refer to human beings as human systems, right? Mind, body, spirit, this integrated system, right? Human systems are number one, hackable. And number two, they're incredible. How can you tell what's a good hack versus what's just useless? And, and the reason I bring this up is because it seems like everybody today is taking ice baths. Yeah, done that. Miserable experience. <laughs> Does it several times. <laughs> I'll still do it, and it's still miserable. <laughs> but does that actually bring about results? Do you think it will? I don't know. You know, we know, we can measure through the lens of science at the subatomic level that looking at an object, a physical object, has a physical effect on that object. We have proven that through the power of your mind and thought and intention and attention, you can build muscle mass. You can lose weight. You don't necessarily go to the gym. You literally can build or can build muscle or lose fat by, by thinking, you know, oversimplified way to say it, but by thinking about it. So whatever, this is one of those whatever you think you're right kinds of things. Now, sure, there's plenty of science to back up the inflammation and the circulation and all the things, right? And you can, you as a human will hack that system if you don't think it'll work, you can stop it from working. I mean, you look at what Wim Hof has done, Wim, Iceman Hof, is, as he's known, right? He's injected himself with like Ebola virus and he's, he's got the world record for sitting in like 38 degree water for two and a half hours or something ridiculous. I mean, I, I don't remember the numbers now, but it's like if you're just, when I was a kid, I saw a Daffy Duck Looney Tunes cartoon and Daffy was riding an invisible bicycle around a boxing ring. And he said, I'm so crazy. I don't know this isn't possible. And I built my life on that, I think. If I'm just dumb enough to think I can do it, I probably will. It almost seems like insanity at points, though. <laughs> you know, Fine line between not. insanity and brilliance, right? Yes. And look, you know, I mean, and at one point, it was insane to think you could drive faster than 60 miles an hour. They thought the skin would peel off your face. Like, that was science. <laughs> Right. So you, you have to be a little insane. I mean, because how how are you going to achieve the seemingly impossible if it doesn't look completely batshit crazy? And that makes sense. I, I think where I struggle with this is there's a lot of people you see them and they believe certain things. But yet. It never happens. Is it because they're actually not doing the work? They haven't like. I think too often people just think, oh, if I think about it, it'll happen. But it's it's got to be, it's more than just that. 
Yeah, you know, we talk about manifestation, we talk about, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, what one of my teachers said, and and he was um he was much more on the kind of the woo side of things. I straddle the line between woo and science, right? My old man's an electromagnetic compatibility engineer, and I'm educated in spiritual psychology, right? So I can I can I can swim in both ponds. Um the whoops. The um the thing about manifestation is what what my teacher would say is God, or whatever name you want to give it, universe, source, spirit, consciousness, energy, whatever, um, God meets you at the point of action. So yes, while you can manifest something and think and whatever, you also need to take action. You got to do something. Ultimately, it is matching, and this is where I get a little science and a little woo at the same time, but it's matching your frequency to the frequency of the thing that you want, because then you can bring it to you. The woman that I mentioned earlier with the doubled revenues and the saved marriage and everything, it was tuning her frequency to the frequency of the reality she wanted to experience and getting her out of the reality that she was living in, um, getting out of that frequency. Like a gross oversimplification is dress for the job you want, not the job you have, because it changes your frequency. So my question is then, how do you change your frequency? Again, a lot of modalities. I start with language. You know, Nietzsche understood that, you know, the culture, he said you, that you could tell where a society has been and where it's going by the way that they speak. And so, and I can say the same thing about a human, whether it's a team or an individual, like I just listen to the way they, they speak. I listen to their, their outer, uh, how they relate to each other and how they speak to each other. You know, I give somebody about, I don't know, eight minutes in safe space. They'll tell me everything I need to know. So you can literally change your neurochemistry. You can physiologically change the way your brain works by changing one word in a sentence, and that will change your frequency. I mean, we could do it right now. I could, I could do a little parlor trick on you if you want. <laughs> sure, let's do it. All right. So now think of something that you really want, and you're not going to tell me what the thing is. So let this be real, right? You're not going to announce what the thing is. So think of something that you really want, and you've wanted for a while, and you have some kind of charge around not having it. Maybe there's sadness, maybe there's fear or shame or frustration or whatever, but connect with that. Maybe it's an experience or maybe it's a thing, right? Let me know when you have it. Okay. Okay, great. So think to yourself in your mind and ex it, whatever that experience is, the feeling state, the shame, the fear, the whatever it is, the sadness, anger, I just want that thing. Now connect with how you experience that. Now stay connected with that item and think the exact same thing without the word just. I want that thing. Now, if you're tuned into yourself, you'll notice a subtle difference in your experience between those two things. What, what did you notice in the difference in your experience? Again, without telling me what the thing is. It made it much more possible. It made it much more possible. In that moment, we physiologically changed the way your brain works. We just changed what was happening neurochemically. We changed the neurotransmitters, right? Like everything that's going on in there. And it produced a different feeling state in you. And feelings drive actions and actions produce results, right? Neuroscience. And we also had an effect on your energy field. You know, it's funny because I notice a lot of words that people use around money. Oh, yeah. There's a ton of them. Oh, yeah. I'll never have that or that must be nice. A lot of negative talk. Oh, yeah. And a lot of have, usually with money and time in particular, people think in terms of have or have not dynamics. I don't have this or I do have that. People that look through the lens of have or have not tend to have not. So what lens should we look through? Well, what is money, right? It's like everything else. Money is energy, right? Always in motion, always in flow, right? So it becomes a question of leverage, not a question of getting, right? The money's there. So how do you match yourself to it? What is your relationship to money? Like a question that I'll ask clients is, if, if money were a person sitting next to you and I asked money, hey, money, tell me about your relationship with this person, what would money say? And people say, oh my God, you know, money would say, you know, you don't treat me well or you don't, you don't keep me around or you're not responsible with me or you say I'm not enough or whatever. It's like, why would money want to hang out with you when you're treating them like shit? right? So it's about what is your relationship to money? You start to understand that. You start to understand a lot about your framework and your reality. So let's say somebody has a conversation like that. 
Mm-hmm. They realize they don't have a good relationship with whatever money or whatever the topic is. Mm-hmm. What can they do immediately to start changing that relationship? What would you do if you needed to repair a relationship with a friend of yours? Probably acknowledge it first. Acknowledge right? it. Great. Now, do we need to apologize? Maybe. Is that what you need to do? Like th- this is this is this is very tailored to the individual. You know, I mean, look at it this way. I had a client that was talking um, that had had some kind of precancerous mole removed from her bo- from her skin, right? And she said this was the fifth time it's happened. And I'm like, fifth time? Wait, I track patterns, right? I'm always one off things I don't worry about too much. But when there's a pattern, that's going to get my attention every time. And I'm a genius when it comes to tracking pattern. It's just part of my makeup, right? And I don't mean that from an egoic place. It's just it's kind of how I'm wired. So I said five times your body has gone through this. Your body is talking to you. And I had that same conversation. If your body was a person sitting next to you and I asked your body, tell me about your relationship. Oh man, she says, I'm, I'm not thin enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not this enough. I'm not that enough. I'm like, your body is pissed, right? Like you are not in a good relationship with your body. So I had to write a letter. You know, I said, you know, here's the exercise. You're going to write a letter to your body and you're going to fix this relationship. And she went on a campaign. I think it was about three months. Um, about making that relationship healthy again. You can do the same thing with money. You can do the same thing with time. Just like it's a best friend that you wronged in some way and you now realize, oh my God, I've been really shitty to you. I want to fix this. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man Podcast. Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. So why aren't more people proactive with these things? Lack of awareness. I mean, really. They're just stuck in the drift. I mean, again, you're look, you're going to have something like 70,000 thoughts today. You're going to make about 33,000 decisions. How many of those are we aware of? I mean, this is why I have a job, right? My job is to hack and understand that human system and recode it to the outcome somebody wants. Can you share a little bit about Banana World? (laughs) I love Banana World. It's one of my favorite tools. So Banana World is an exercise that we use when people really get stuck. And there's quite simply, and I'll, I'll just give this one to you. Banana world is a world of the ridiculous, the absurd, and the fantastic, where even the laws of physics don't apply. So the way it works is you have a situation in which you are stuck and you want to change in some way, shape, or form or get out of. And the idea is to say, okay, what is one thing that you could do that you would never actually do. We're not looking for viable solutions. We're not looking for real world answers, okay? If you had a real world answer, you would have done it already. So I'm not looking for a real world. I'm looking for banana world. I'm looking for stupid, absurd, insane, nothing you would ever do answer. But if you did it, you would no longer be in that situation. So what this looked like with uh, one client in particular, she was kind of trapped in trapped in her, her marriage, her home, her job, trap, trap, trap. I said, okay. Let's go to Banana World, right? Explain the whole thing. I said, what is the one thing that you could do that you would never do that if you did it, you would no longer be stuck in that situation? And she thought about it and she said, well, I could fake my death and move to Costa Rica. Yes, if you faked your death and moved to Costa Rica, you would no longer be in that situation. What else? Now, the more we spend time in Banana World, the more ridiculous and funny this gets. The funnier it gets, the more fun this is. The more fun this is, the less somebody feels stuck. I'm driving a massive amount of dopamine, right? Pleasure chemical in the brain. It's a lot of fun. Hits the pleasure centers, right? So now we're having fun. We're goofing off. 
Now this person's in a completely different feeling state, having completely different thoughts. Their creative centers of their brain are opened up. Instead of all the contraction around can't, 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 it's like, this is whimsical and fun. And well, what if we did this? And what if we do that? Now, here's the magic, right? Now that I've affected somebody's psychology, now that I've affected their neurochemistry, now that I've affected their energy field and opened up the creative centers of their brain, viable solutions start to slip into the absurd answers. And the next thing you know, you actually have some kind of workable solution or a wireframe for something that might become a workable solution. It's magical. Can people do this on their own or do they need someone to help them? Well, absolutely not. I'm clearly the only person on the planet that somebody could call to do this. <laughs> of course, they can do it on their own, right? But they, they have to be willing to get out of their own way, you know? And it's so helpful to have a consultant, a coach, a, a confidant, a partner, like somebody to do this with. Because when, when I get into a room with somebody, and this is why clients actually like me in the room, you say, because we can do, we do a lot, of, most of our work is done online. Every now and then they're like, Chris, I want you in the room. Because what they've reported is that there's a compound interest effect when I'm physically there. And it just has to do with energy fields and everything. It's like, yeah, I, I mean, here's the dirty little secret of my performance coaching days. I could go into an organization and make them about anywhere from 15 to 20% more effective, more efficient, more productive by doing no work whatsoever. The fact that they knew I was coming and, and just bringing some energy, that alone was going was gonna to raise the bar. And so, so working with a client, when I go in there, it's um, even one-on-one, -on -one, just me being with them is going to have an uptick in the energy and it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a compound interest effect. It's almost like placebo effect. Well, it's not. Yes and no. I mean, because there is that if you think it work, if you think it works at will thing. But there's also the reality of electromagnetic energy fields, you know. And this is this is where my old man could talk chapter and verse, you know. If and, and if you think I word economy is a challenge for me, talk to that man, right? He can't tell a five minute story in under half an hour. Um, but <laughs> yeah, is that a belief? That's a statistical reality. <laughs> and that's that's a king. That's a that's a king family trait. As for the men in the king family, that's that's us, man. <laughs> My grandfather, dad's dad, was quite stoic, but the rest of us jabber on like you know, like there's no tomorrow. Out of curiosity, are you at all familiar with the Savannah bananas? With what? The Savannah bananas. The Savannah bananas. I'm not familiar with this. You got to check out the Savannah bananas. It goes along with your banana story. Okay, love it. Jesse Cole's a business guy, and he he wears a yellow tuxedo everywhere he goes. Um, that is his thing. But he he bought this minor league baseball team, and when they did the back of the napkin math, they're like, "There is no way this team is ever going to make me money. I'm going to lose money." And so he reinvented everything, and so he looked at everything dramatically differently, and they. They're sold out. Like trying to get tickets for them is impossible. Um, and he he reimagined his whole world. I just kind of bring that up because of the story that you told. And look, there there are no shortage of impossible things. You know, I, I can be a little dismissive sometimes, and somebody says that's impossible. I say you're just saying that because it's never been done. <laughs> you know, and um, and and things really are only impossible until they're not. I mean, look at 1980, Lake Placid, miracle, you know, miracle at Lake Placid. These these kids, you know, went up and and won the gold medal. There was no way anybody thought that was possible, right? Look at the moon landing, right? Whether whether you believe in it or not, right? Some people believe it happened. Other people believe it's a conspiracy and that it didn't. But either way, it was a wild success because either this impossible thing we landed on the moon, we made that happen. Or we pulled the biggest scam in history and it's still going on. Like either way, it's a success, right? So, so impossible has happened here, right? When you shoot for the impossible, you right? know, it happens. Like, I, I live and in a town where people pay $30 for avocado toast. There's nothing crazier than that. I mean, come on, <laughs> right? You can make impossible happen. Somebody made a pet rock. What was that? The 70s, the pet rock and sold like yeah. millions of those damn things. Yeah. Whatever, so you have a listener right now that really wants to do something and thinks it's dumb or crazy or impossible. And I'm just going to remind them that somebody made millions selling a pet rock. That <laughs> People are making billions selling Bitcoin. Right? 
<laughs> Who thought we could create a currency completely digital and somebody sell did. It to people. I mean, see, that's the thing. Somebody is the answer. You know, in the 60s, when Star Trek launched, there were, you know, most of the kids watching, and this is before my time, but most of the kids watching it saw that as sci science fiction. A small percentage of kids saw that as a goal. How do, I, how do I take a handheld device and talk to somebody way over there, like way over there, like a different continent or in space? Yeah, we can do that now. It's incredible. It's wild, right? I mean, but think about how bad shit crazy you would have sounded back then. We should, we should build those. Like, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> You know, it's funny because if you go back and you read Jules Verne's books, mm -hmm. he was writing 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Was that in like the 1800s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that. And yeah. there's a submarine that so much of what he actually wrote about came to be much, much later in life as time went on. I mean, what if some of these people, what if, what if they weren't just wild or whatever? What if they had some kind of insight? Like, what if it wasn't just wacky imagination? What if it was insight? What if they just knew something? Maybe they didn't even know they knew it, but there was something in there that was real enough for them. Interesting. So one of the things you said in the book is everything about you is a gift and a tool perfectly yeah. designed to support you in achieving your life's missions. Yes. One of the things I've noticed is a lot of people are unaware of their gifts. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I didn't even realize how valuable some of my gifts were until much later in life. Would mm -hmm. have been helpful to know it sooner. Yeah. Anything you think is a liability about you, you have misidentified. And if you start asking yourself, okay, let's say Chris is not completely out of his mind. Let's say this thing about me that I don't like is really a gift. How might that be true? Now, I, I, for my, most of my life, people told me that I talk too much. I know you're going to be shocked to hear that one. Um, but <laughs> they said, you know... They said, you know, you talk all the time. They said, you, you will talk. We will pay you to stop talking, right? That was, that, that was like the joke in my life. Well, once I changed my relationship to my abilities, <laughs> well, once people said they would pay me to shut up, now they pay me not to, right? That wasn't a liability at all. It was a gift that I misidentified and maybe misappropriated. You know, I'm five, six if I'm an inch. Right. And I used to think that that was a terrible thing. You know, I mean, women wanted tall, dark and handsome. Here I am, short, pasty, white, curiously attractive. Right. But <laughs> but I and I when I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not the guy that you see come into the room, you know, the big strapping guy that you see and that you notice coming to the room. And I think that's a terrible liability. No, I'm the guy you don't see coming in the room. That makes me a ninja. Right. That makes me the silent assassin. Like I'm going to get in there and do things. That no, and, and it's going to be done before anybody knows I'm there. And that's exactly what I do with organizations. I mean, we're, we're way ahead before they even realize it. Another thing you talk about in the book is framing. Mm -hmm. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Well, how you frame something is going to change your relationship to it. I live and work in a very binary world, right? Working or not working, effective or ineffective, is the way you're relating to this, is the way you're remembering it getting you what you want? Is it giving you the experience you want or achieving the goal that you want? Because what, what's affecting you right now, especially about your past, um, is, is not the thing itself. It's your relationship to it. So it's like if your dad left and your parents got divorced or, you know, like dad was like really drunk when I was a kid or whatever, that's not affecting me today. That's long gone. What's affecting me today is how I relate to that, how I remember it, how I'm holding it in my consciousness. So if my goal is to have a really good relationship with my father, and it is, right? And we actually have a pretty good relationship. Um, I can say, well, he, you know, he hit the bottle and he hit me and he was gone a lot because he traveled and he was a terrible dad and, you know, all these kind of things. Or I can look at it through the frame of my dad didn't have a lot of coping skills. His, his uh, first child died at the age of 11. He didn't know how to cope, so he threw himself into the bottle, and he was really frustrated, and so he didn't know how to manage his anger, and he threw himself into work because he just figured, if I just make enough money, then I can throw money at whatever problem comes and ensures the survival of the family. Like, which one of these stories is true? Quite simply, the one I choose. 
which one is aligned with the outcome that I want. I want a good relationship with my dad. So I'm going to choose the one where it's like, man, he had a really hard time and I'm going to release all of my judgments around him and knowing that him and everybody else is always doing the best they can in any given moment. And I'm going to let him off the hook because whatever childhood wounds I have now at my age, those are my responsibility. It is not on somebody else to fix my shit. None of my childhood was my quote unquote fault, but all of it is my responsibility. It's funny how few people take responsibility. Well, it's not their fault. They're not trained to. And in fact, they're trained quite the opposite. We live in a world where the media and the government supports the victim consciousness. They support disempowerment. They want us to be completely ineffectual. But when you take 100% responsibility for your life, that is the day your life changes. It's exactly what happened to me after two failed marriages and all crap that I've been through after the addiction and the rage and all the stuff the, the, the like at 30, what was I, 37 years old, I woke up and was like, all right, you know what? It's on me now. Enough is enough. Take courage. And maybe that's not the right word. You got to let yourself and everybody else off the hook. You got to get out of blame right? Blame involves victim consciousness and all this stuff. If you can stop blaming um, and just recognize that, like I said, everybody's doing the best they can in any given moment. And I'll tell you what, when you let yourself off the hook, that's when really things really start changing. Um, behavior is something you have, not something you are, right? Thoughts, feelings, your body, your behavior is something you have. And it's like, all right, that's what I did doing the best I could at the time. And, and that's, that's, you know, a quote from that, the Magnificent Seven, right? Vin in 1960, I think. Um, that's what he says. He says, you know, it seemed to be a good idea at the time. Every mistake you've ever made can be summed up with that sentence. It seemed to be a good idea at the time. Now, you know, a little different, a little better. Cool. Learn and move on. But you got to get, you got to let yourself off the hook. You know, there was a short phrase in the book that I very much enjoyed, which was, now what? Yeah. I remember um, it was with my first wife. She had bipolar disorder, and so we were um, we were in a group thing with uh, with a psychotherapist. And she was talking to somebody else in the group, and she was the first therapist that I was actually like, "This person's nails, okay, this one gets it." And she said to to the person, "says You know, it really sucks that happened to you, and I'm sorry." And now I don't really go down those roads, but. She was very compassionate about this, this person's history. And she said, yeah, it's really awful. It sounds really hard. And that was a really rough time. Now what? Like, what are you going to do now? Are you going to be defined by this? Are you going to keep on that hamster wheel of justifying and explaining and defending and be like, well, it's not my fault because, or are you going to put on your big girl panties and deal here? Like, you're, by the time you hit 25 years old and you are not just a legal adult, but a biological adult, it, that's when you have the opportunity and you have the capacity if you're willing to take full responsibility for your life. Think of responsibility as a hyphenated word. Response hyphen ability. Your ability to respond. Right? You have the ability to respond to any situation. The question is, are you going to make the choice to do so? Well, we all respond. It's just whether it's a good response or a bad right. response, right? Are you going to collapse? Are you going to are you going to take the bull by the horns? Are you going to do your best to move forward? Or are you just going to sit there and wallow? Like, what are you going to do? Nobody's coming to save you, right? You know, it's like, look, you can do anything. You can do anything. It's funny because I think a lot of people limit what they believe they can do. Yeah. I know a guy, um, you know what, I, I, it's not my story, so it's not my story to tell, but he's, his name is Jeff, I won't, I won't out him, um, but Jeff was in prison for, I think, the third time, and he's this tattooed, badass kind of dude, and his third, his third stint in prison, he just fell to his knees, was like, all right, God, clearly I don't have the answers, you tell me, and this man built a successful life for himself, and, you know, he's, he's got a wife, and, and like really changed because he just decided I'm, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to take responsibility here and do something different. And he changed his life. There are no shortage of inspirational stories out there. There's a guy, Arthur, you, you do a YouTube for search for Arthur inspirational. And it's this guy that was 300 pounds and disabled vet. And he went on a mission to fix himself and he did it. 
The doctors told him you're never going to walk again without braces. And spoiler alert, at the end of the video, that guy's running down the street. Don't tell me what can't be done. I'm not having it. I'm not. That sounds like a good belief pattern. Well, it's a choice. Carlos Castaneda said, we make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. That is true. Right? It takes a lot of work to stay miserable. Right? <laughs> and one of my teachers said, you know, everything's a story, right? Everything you're telling about yourself, about other people, about your situations, it's a story. And he used to say, if you're going to tell a story, might as well be a good one. I concur. So there you go. There's my litany of pseudo poetic one liners and quotes from other people. <laughs> You've got a program to help people get unstuck. We do. I'm so excited about this. Um, you know, there, there's any number of ways you can get stuck, uh, whether it's career or personal relationships or, um, or just life in general. And so it's the Get Unstuck program. And this is designed to do exactly that. There are four different flavors of it. There's the life transitions. There's the love, dating, and situationships, as we call it. Uh, there's the what we call the miserable millionaire, which is generally historically been a man in his 40s or 50s that kind of has it all, but really is not satisfied with his life. May not be totally miserable, but really not happy with where he is. Um, and then there's destination unknown, where it's like, we, we don't know what, but we know it's not this. And so whatever format of stuck or trapped, that, uh, that's the program that gets people out of it. And like I said, we're seeing incredible transformations. We have one right now. This guy called me up and he said, um, I, I hear you're the guy that makes impossible thing happens. I said, yeah, that's what we do. He says, well, what if the impossible thing relies on another person? I said, okay, I got you. What, what do you got? He says, well, I want to keep my business going. It's been very good. I said, okay. He says, I, I don't want to work as much. I'm like, look, this is way below my pay grade so far. And he said, okay, look, my, my wife left me. She's moved out. She's got her own place and she's filed for divorce already. And I want to save the marriage. So I started working with him one-on-one. -on -one. Fast forward about four weeks. She's done a 180 on this and really reconsidering if this is the right thing. We've also discovered that the reason that she left really wasn't about him or the marriage. There's a deeper thing going on. Now, here's the magic part. I haven't even talked to that woman. Working with him, changing the way he relates to her, himself, and his situation has changed his frequency and subsequently is changing his reality. Now, I can't guarantee, obviously, what's going to happen, but I can guarantee this much. Everything turns out just fine. And I think too often we think we have to change the other person and we refuse to change ourselves. Yeah, Jordan Peterson talks about that, and I really appreciate some of the things he says. And one of them is, you know, before you go trying to fix the world, get your own house in order. Yeah, that's a rarity. Right? <laughs> so much easier to put it on. No, if, if you would just do this, then I would do that. If you wouldn't say this or do this, then I wouldn't do that. And that's a beautiful way to offload responsibility. Responsibility is like health food, right? The difference between responsibility and and blame is the same as it is between health food and junk food. Junk food is the blame, right? It feels good in the moment, right? But a couple hours later, it doesn't feel so good. Your body's like, ugh, gross, right? Responsibility, not nearly as fun in the moment. It's like, you, you sort of got to admit, okay, I screwed up here or whatever. Um, but, but how many times, I mean, you know, think about your own life. How many times have you owned up to something where you, you know, shit the bed and you're like, all right, I'm going to own it. And how much better does that feel? It does, it's not fun in the moment. So much easier to say, oh, it's not my fault. They didn't get back to me or they didn't call or this didn't happen and offload, offload, offload. When you go, you know what? I didn't get it done. That's on me. It's not fun, but it's empowering. It is. I have to ponder some of these things. I mean, look, ba basic neuroscience is that feelings drive actions and actions produce results. One of the first things I'm going to do when I go into an organization or even with an individual, I'm going to remove the feelings that are driving the actions that are getting us in our way. Typically, there's two. There's like 27 feelings in the human experience, but the two of them that I'm going to remove real quick, fear and shame. I get rid of fear and shame in an organization. I change the whole, I change the whole planet for them. I thought you were going to say fear and ego. No, uh, ego is not a feeling. I mean, it's, you know, there, there are, you know, egoic structures and everything that get in the way, but no, the fear... Fear and shame are the things like if I'm, 
like if, if somebody goes in and says, oh, the client didn't get back to me, right? It's being driven by either the shame that they didn't get it done or follow up or the fear that they're going to get fired, right? So, but if somebody has a safe environment and a strong team and a strong business to where somebody can go into the boss and say, hey, boss, you know what? It didn't happen. I didn't get it done. I'm like, all right, well, what do we need to do to pivot here? How do we make this work? Now what? Right? Now what? <laughs> But we got to get out of that whole fear and you have to have somebody in that other chair that is of that same consciousness that is like, all right, look, I, you know, do I want to freak out and get all judgmental and be like, how could you do this and whatever? Or do I want to fix it? Do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Do you want to be right or do you want to be fast? Do you want to be right or do you want to be loved? Right? This gets real simple when I get binary. That it does. That it does. And I, and I intentionally oversimplify these things because it makes it simple. And the simpler it is, the easier it is. And, and I'll tell you, you know, when the lawyers, I work, I work with lawyers, I run in that world sometimes. And lawyers will tell you that time kills deals. I'll tell you, money loves speed. You want to be rich? Be fast. You want to be successful? Be fast. It's a lot easier to steer a car going 70 than one that's going four. It's true. I tell people, you know, you can't steer the ship until you get out of port. Right. That's exactly because it. If you're not doing anything, you're not underway. And, and I've noticed that in my own life. I have found that my biggest obstacle is getting started. But once I start, things just happen. Yeah. Well, basic physics, right? You know, it's, you know, an, an, uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Interesting. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? <laughs> uh, be in an, an abundant mindset. That's simple, right? It really is. You're either in contraction or expansion, scarcity or abundance, survive or thrive. It's very binary. Be in abundance, in thrive, in expansion. That is how you're going to make, that's how you're going to create an abundant life. You cannot be abundant from scarcity any more than you can lose weight by eating cake. These are just diametrically opposed things, right? You want abundant? Be abundant. I lost weight eating ice cream. <laughs> well, I guess if you eat nothing else, maybe, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I lost a lot of weight when I was on cocaine. Like, well, yeah, that'll do it. You know what, I mean? <laughs> what did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? That's a really good question. What I learned later that I wish I learned sooner was um, that there's a lot of things in there. <laughs> Do I have to pick one? I, I think, you know, and I think we touched on it or, uh, earlier is get your house in order first. I, th I think the delayed gratification thing would have been really helpful for me, you know, because I was always instant gratification. I want what I want when I want it, which is now. It's like, look, if you really want it long-term and sustainable, you got to build the foundation, right? You can't just have the house. You have to build the foundation. And so, you know, this is kind of one of those slow is smooth and smooth is fast things. You know, I do a lot of training with retired Navy SEALs and they'll say that, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And so, um, so I think if I could have delayed my gratification, uh, that, that would have made for a much smoother path and a faster one ultimately. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm a big believer in building the foundation. I think, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's slow and it's boring and it's not exciting, but you do it right. Everything else will then sit on top of it and then it becomes quick and easy. Yeah. And it'll be sustainable. And it'll be sustainable. If you were to give an 18 year old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? I would tell any 18-year-old that you are basically a talking lizard and you have about seven years before you can process information like an adult because you are not, while the, the government will love to tell you that, that at 18, you're a legal adult, neuro, neurobiology, you are not a biological adult until you're about 25. So the idea of like, like, you don't need to worry about getting married or whatever, like you need to become who you are and build your life from that foundation, right? And that's not going to happen until your mid 20s. So, um, so yeah, that's, you know, d delay whatever you're thinking until you're at least 25. <laughs> Don't get a tattoo. 
maybe not get married. You know, I mean, it, I, and look, I'm not saying it can't work, right? I'm just saying you're going to give yourself a much better shot if you make sure that you're aligned with everything. And, um, and I think be a, being a biological adult who can process complex uh, issues and problems is sort of necessary before you go, you know, running off and doing something like I did. <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> if people would like to learn more about you and your programs, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, we set up a, uh, a page just for you and your audience. So it's uh, statusflow.net. So it's like uh, going from status quo to status flow. Uh, statusflow.net forward slash richer soul. And we will put that in the show notes to help people find you. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and, uh, and letting me talk about this stuff that, that has changed my life and that I love so much. So thank you. Most welcome. What is it that you want to change or do that you're holding back on? Do you need one of those banana sessions? It's amazing how fast Chris can get people to change. This doesn't have to take a lifetime. That's really the power of having a coach and having someone hold the mirror up to you and call you out on the parts that aren't serving you. Once it's possible, it's easier to achieve and you can start taking action one step at a time. By the way, who do you know who needs to hear this message? Would you do me a favor? Would you share this episode with them? I would appreciate that. Next week, we've got Christina Wise on. She's going to talk about how to create a wealthy life. And who doesn't want a wealthy life? Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.